This is 007 Radio. Strap yourself in, because we'll be going on a ride deep to the heart of Earth's mysteries. Okay, I'm here with John Anthony West, uh, Egyptologist. Most known for his books that he has written, would you like to name some of them for us? Um, there aren't that many, so it won't take that long. <laughs> um, the ones about Egypt are Serpent in the Sky, which is a full-scale um, introduction, in-depth introduction to the work of the great French genius with the unpronounceable name R.A. Schwaler de Lubitsch, or Schwaler de Lubitsch. Um, and then there's the guidebook. Uh, which is all of Egypt seen through symbolist eyes, the traveler's key to ancient Egypt. And before that, this is all a nonfiction field. Uh, my first nonfiction book, which was called The Case for Astrology, that's now out of print. Um, and then there are the other books, that, because I didn't start out doing Egypt. I started out um, as a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, essayist, that sort of thing. So those books are... The ones I wrote is a book of short stories and another novel and a bunch of plays and a lot of things like that, but they probably don't come into the conversation tonight, even though that wearing that hat, rather than my Egyptological pith helmet, wearing my bohemian beret is in fact, in a way, more fun for me uh, than, than the scholars. I'm a scholar by default, put it this way, I'm a scholar by default. And, and a writer by, by, they say, genetically a writer. So you start, writer. Off, you start off as a writer. What thrusts you down this rabbit hole? You come across this, this French Renaissance man. Ah, uh, well, that, that's a long story. It's, uh, okay, brief autobiography. Um, at the age of 13 or so, I recognized something that very few 13-year-olds recognized at that time that I was born into a lunatic asylum and that everybody was crazy and they were all lying to each other, including myself. Um, and by the time I was 19, I knew what I wanted, I was sure of what I wanted to do, which was I wanted to be the little boy who said the emperor has no clothes. I wanted to make sure that as many people as possible knew that it was a lunatic asylum. And so set off satire, very ferocious satire was my medium. And I started out in the first few years, of course, being unsuccessful. And But the first short story was published, that I wrote was published in, uh, or accepted in 57. And I was wildly in love with a woman at that time who wouldn't have me, thank God. And decided I'd already spent a year and a half in Europe in the army. And decided that I had to get out of New York where I was working as a copywriter for an advertising agency because I was now a published writer. And I found my way to the magic, then magical island of Ibiza in the more, all of this is a long story, which I will somewhere along the line get around to telling in a book, I hope. But on Ibiza, this one of the Balearic, the second smallest of, of the Balearic Islands off the coast of Spain, and there I, I, I gravitated to with this one short story under my belt and spent nine years there, most of it on a visa, sometimes going up to Amsterdam and Paris and London for the winters, where you could live in those days on $50 a month comfortably. There was, I mean, those were, remember, these were, these were nine, late $1950, which are different. Were from, they hard to come across? So like, was it easy what? to make 50 bucks? Well, I, I had, a, I had a, a little bit of a grub stake. I had, when I was in the army, I was, I was stationed in Germany at an incredible job that I worked at for, I calculated it, eight minutes a day. And I had a bit of money saved up from summer jobs while I was in the States. And so I bought my one and only Porsche um, for $2,400 new from the factory in Stuttgart and spent most of my 18 months in, in, in Germany driving around because it was a corrupt company and you could bribe the master sergeant to get extra days of leave on the weekends. So I spent much of my time driving around with my lovely German girlfriend all over Europe in my one and only Porsche. 
and the army shipped the Porsche back for me for nothing. <laughs> oh. And when I got out of the army, that's 54. And um, so I sold the Porsche plus the little money that I got from my from my um, first sale, my first short story sale, which was not so little. I mean, really, it was two hundred and seventy dollars, which these days would be the same as about twenty five hundred dollars. So that was not nothing. That was that. Anyway, that was what got me back to uh, Euro to Europe. And so the fifty dollars a month, I could live for over a year on fifty dollars a month, and I had over fifty dollars a month. So anyway, that's what got the whole thing going. And there I was writing my novel that eventually got published in 66. But with a lot of, it was a really quite extraordinary place, Ibiza, in those days. And a lot of very interesting people, some with real talent, most of them were just drunk and drugged most of the time. Um, so lots of parties. But I, I had a number of friends, and one of them was a generation older than myself, who was a resistance hero in Holland and a very, very good writer. And one day I caught him accidentally, because um, you weren't in those days, no no telephones, no anything, and you didn't barge in on other people in the middle of the day just because you were lonely or depressed or weren't, you know, had writer's block and couldn't work. So you didn't go bug, you didn't bother other people. But I ran out of paper and town was far away and there was no paper. And I went in to see my friend and said, hey, I know, I'm not here for long. I'll go in two seconds. Um, I just need some paper. He said, okay, okay. And he went in to get some paper and <clears throat> came out in a few minutes. But meanwhile, I noticed on his desk, he had a whole big long desk and with these papers that he put pie charts on them with drawings. And I said to him, what the hell is that, Jan? Jan Tonder was his name. Um, and he said, oh, he said, you caught me. I don't tell people about this, but I'm an astrologer and I do this in my spare time to make some extra bucks. He, he was quite, he was a very good writer and quite well known in Holland, but, you know, he still could use some extra bucks. So I said, oh, well, that's a bunch of bullshit. I mean, astrology. And he looked at me square in the eye and he said, do you think I'm a fool? And I said, no. I said, you're a drunk, but you're not a fool. And my next question was, well, will you do my horoscope? And he said, no, get stuff, do your own. And he handed me a bunch of books. So anything is easier than writing. And I took the books home and started reading. And most of these, now remember, this is late 50s. And most of these books were very theosophical in, in cast. I mean, there was always a whiff of sort of old ladies with blue rinsed hairs and tennis shoes and anti-vivisection about them. But there was something in it that really piqued my interest. And I got really fascinated by this. And then, again, more long story, but from that interest, Jan was very smart. He kept quiet about it. But me, with my big mouth, I had to tell everybody that there was something to astrology. And there was a guy there on Ibiza who was not even a close friend, but a friendly friend. Ibiza was a place, it was one of the last places, maybe on Earth, where there was a real cafe society. It was like, it was sort of like Paris in the 20s without the prodigious amount of talent, actually quite a few people with real talent, but everybody would meet in the cafes in the evening and, you know, hang around and have drinks and bullshit and, you know, just have fun. And anyway, this guy came up to me one day knowing about my interest in astrology and said, well, I have a, an interesting book you'd be interested in called, it was called The, uh, the, uh, the Theory of Celestial Influence by a man named Rodney Collin. So, he put me onto that, and that really interested me. It was something completely not in all of the other theosophical kind of books about astrology. It wasn't about how to cast a chart or how to interpret one. It was about why there was something to astrology, why there was a correspondence between events in the heavens and, let's say, personality on Earth. And Colin was a pupil of Gurdjieff, and my friend wouldn't allow me to read Gurdjieff right away. He was a very good psychologist because I would have thrown it away. But anyway, gradually, gradually, I got, I got led into the Gurdjieff work, which has really been my, let's say, my intellectual, philosophical, and spiritual base of the last, since I was put onto it, which must be, what, early 60s. So more than 50 years uh, involved in the Gurdjieff work in one way or another. And anyway, 
So meanwhile, I was reading all about astrology and I, was, I wasn't much interested in, in, in doing charts, which was not my great strength, but I soon learned as I was doing them. Um, in case you're wondering, this is my silver vodka cup. It's silver? Uh, mm. You're lucky. Vodka out of a silver cup is a big difference. It's alchemical or homeopathic or something. It makes a real difference. If you drink red wine out of a silver cup, it's terrible. Oh, I heard so many stories about people using silver as the medical as a medical uh, basis yeah, well, for healing is, wounds. So that's right. Milk, this, uh, putting this a coin is, in milk this, or something. Well, this is doubly medical. This is the silver itself, and then there's the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, you so, just spoke about how you were you just right, started casting charge. Well, and so, and, and it, it, I soon found out, because I was practicing on all the people around Ibiza, all my friends, and doing casting charts, and I, I realized very quickly that all the women wanted to be told was that they were going to meet a tall, dark, handsome stranger, and all the men wanted to be told was that they were going to make a million dollars and they were geniuses. And I said, you know, you know, nobody wanted to hear anything that was in the least bit negative about them. So, and I, I wasn't, I had no particular talent for, for casting charts anyway, but the, the symbolism of it and the archetypes and the possibility that it was much, much older than it's currently given credit for. I mean, it's, you ask anybody, uh, you know, in Quackademia about astrology, it's all uh, you know, nonsense and it's a Babylonian superstition. Although if you ask them what causes the tides, they'll tell you the moon, of course. Oh, the moon, but yes. what does that have to do with Well, that's just, that's just gravity or something like that. Anyway, I, I was very interested in this and, and, and did a lot of research, um, even before I knew how to do research. And then I moved, it was time to leave Ibiza. I'd been there for nine years. And I moved to England. And then my first novel was published. And I got I got friendly with the editor, who was a mathematician turned publisher, young guy about my age, um, very smart guy, very opposite me in in philosophy. Actually, we were still good friends. He was basically a rationalist and a materialist and so on, mm -hmm. but smart. Um, occasionally, those guys are, not often. And one day we were having a you know a, a, a jar and a, a, a pint in a pub. And the subject of astrology came up. And he said, oh, that's a bunch of codswallop. And I said, well, no, as a matter of fact, it isn't. I know a lot about this subject. And I have a certain amount of evidence, some of it, some of it indirect, some of it direct, but most of it indirect. And if you put it all together, you'd have a case for astrology. And he said, well, look, I'd like to see that. And so I brought in a whole bunch of documentation when I saw him next. And he said, well, that's very interesting. Would you do a book on it? And money has always been one of the big problems in my life, along with women. And, um, you know, he said, would you do a book on it? And I said, well, you know, pay me some, some money, I'll do a book on anything, which is not quite true, but it was, a good, it was a good line. And so all of a sudden there, I had this contract to do a book called The Case for Astrology. And all of a sudden I had to be, I had to do scholarship. So anyway, it took some years, and um, I, I finally got the book done, which was reasonably successful over the course, and then I rewrote it in the 90s, now it's out of print. But anyway, in doing the research, I was now in a Gerd Jeff group in England, and in doing the research, I was interested in trying to prove, from a scholarly point of view, not just hearsay, that astrology was much, much older than it's given credit for. And one of the people in my Gerd Jeff group said, well, you know, you should go read and, and, you know, get hold of a book called Herbach. It's a novel in two parts by a woman called Isha Schwaller de Lubitsch. Um, and and that's, that should interest you. So I went to what was then, now we're talking, what year is it, 67 maybe? And there was one bookstore in England at that time. I think there were actually two or three, but the best known one was called Watkins. Um, Cecil Court in, uh, in, in London, it was an esoteric bookstore. And there, and, and I didn't understand why it was there, I learned later, on a bookshelf that was devoted to the Gurdjieff work were these two, two volume novel called Herbach um, and Herbach a Disciple. And these were the work of 
Isha Shwala Dulevich, who was R.A. Shwala Dulevich's wife. And as a novel, it was really a lousy novel. Um, but in terms of the picture of Egypt that was produced, it corresponded in a most remarkable way with everything that Gurdjieff had written about it. And, and it, was, it was absolutely fascinating. And so much so, and it was in French, and, and uh, my French at that time was fairly rudimentary, but I, basically I took a year off from where I lived in London and went in the tube every day all the way across London. I don't know if you know London, but Ealing is miles away from the British Museum. And you know, got sat down at the British Museum with my French dictionary, plowing my way um, through Shwala Village. Oh, I should say, with Herbach, it was tra that was the only work of Shwala's that had been translated into English. But she, Isha, kept on referring to R.A. Shwala de Lubitz, to the actual, to the big book called the Temple de Lam, the Temple of Man, um, and with a lot of footnotes, even though it was a novel, it was filled with footnotes. Really fascinating book. It was just terrible writing and lousy as a novel because sometimes people think just because they know a subject that all you have to do is to put the stuff down in novel form. But you can't do a novel, you have to, characters have to work, they have to be three, flesh and blood, they have to be three dimensional. And a lot of people, very smart people, don't realize that it's not so easy to write a novel. Anyway, um, so finally I bit the bullet and went all the way across London. And there, sure enough, they had a copy of, of Schwaller's of the French, Le Temple de l'Homme. And I just took off about nine months out of my life sitting down there every day reading through this absolutely amazing book. And by this time, I was already a pro. You know, I had a lot of stuff published. It seems that a lot of the, the scenarios leading up to this had set the stage for this. Well, you know, everybody's life, whatever your life is, and I don't know what it is, everything that you've done in the past has set the, the stage for where you are now. Mm -hmm. Very simple. If you, and it, when you look back on these things, it's not as though they're foreordained. For the most part, we have less choice than we think we have in making decisions and in doing things. But if you look back, you'll see that one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And then either you end up on the gallows or you end up, you know, having an interesting conversation by Skype about Egypt. Anyway, <laughs> the, so... So you pick up the book of the Temple of Man. Well, I mean, actually... I, you're in Montreal. You speak French? Are you yes. French Canadian? Oui. What? Yeah, we oui, speak no, Français. Oui, bien sûr. But, you know, all, I don't know if they're still that way, but French books used to be uncut, right? You get a book, it was always in paperback, and the pages, the signatures, were still together. So you had to cut the pages yourself to be able to read the book. I'm it was, <laughs> I've oh, you never don't know that. that. Oh, oh. It, was, it was kind of like there was a ritual to it. You know, it was it was like it was a virgin book, and you, you you kind of opened the book. It was it was it was an extraordinary thing. I mean, to the French, I'm sure they were brought up with that, but to me, it was kind of fun cutting cutting the pages of the book. So here was this book that had been written in '57, and I guess I'm doing this work in '67. It was in the library, sure enough. There's two massive volumes, and. And it was uncut. Nobody had ever taken the book out to read it. Oh it's been for 10 years. So there's the book. And so I'm cutting the pages. And of course, I'm already, I'd already read Isha's book, which, as I said, as a novel was terrible, but as a picture of, a, of an advanced civilization, it was brilliant. I mean, it got me to swallow. So, I mean, I just opened these pages. I cut them open. And as a pro, just as, you know, if you're a ball player, you want somebody to take two swings of the bat and you know the guy can play the game. If you're a musician, you watch somebody, if you're a violinist, you watch somebody play a scale, you know, the guy can play the instrument. So with writing, by this time, I mean, I could go, take a book and go like this and get a pretty good idea of what it was about. So with Schroller, this was really, I mean, I had a lot of background by this time. I mean, I not just Gurdjieff, but all kinds of astrology and you know, ancient civilizations and all of the different religions. I, I, you know, I had a pretty solid background, self-taught, but that's maybe the best way. And I just went through the pages of this extraordinary book and realized that th that Schwaller had put together, had reformulated 
the, the, the ancient, the, the wisdom of, of ancient Egypt, which had percolated down through the Renaissance, you know, up until quite recently, up until they invented the Church of Progress in the 19th century, it was assumed by intelligent people that Egypt was the fount of all knowledge. And nobody ever talked about progress. It was the, the alchemists and the Kabbalists of the Renaissance all thought that their knowledge came out of Egypt, correctly so, as a matter of fact. Wasn't most. the name alchemy derived from the original name of Egypt? Was, was Kemet? Yes, Pro almost certainly. Al yeah, Kemet, um, and in, in Arabic, Al-Kemet means the, the, black, the black land in, in ancient Egyptian, and that, that percolated into, um, in, into Arabic, and then from Arabic, you know, that's, that's what the word that, you know, so actually alchemy means Egypt, and for that matter, so does chemistry mean Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the father of chemistry, Isaac Newton, spent most of his time studying astrology and alchemy. Exactly. And uh, I guess we can go on with a list of who's who. That's who right, and, num and number symbolism. And number symbolism, right. yeah. yeah. And this is exactly what you're talking about in the book that you had just opened, is he starts showing you the angles that were well, being shown in yeah, Egypt. It's, it's, it's an amazing book. It's, it's actually... Now it's, it's, it's translated in a wonderful, brilliant translation, two massive volumes, and it is definitely not for everybody. It's sort of like, Gurdjieff is like that too. I mean, it, it, Schwaller is like taking your first driving lesson in a Ferrari. Yeah, you have it's, to come in with a certain amount of knowledge. You have to come in, or at least, sometimes not even the, the knowledge, but at least the the mindset or the heart set you might even say mm -hmm. that allows you to see this way which is diametrically opposed to anything that we're taught in school but anyway instantly i saw that that this riffing through that this guy had done something of immense importance and you know it was glued to the book for the next eight months and then in the original case for astrology i had a big long chapter on Schwaller, which really didn't belong there, but I just couldn't resist. Nobody had knew about this man, um, and the book hasn't been translated into English. So I had this big long chapter, and publishers came to me and said, "Gee, this is really interesting. Would you do a book on Schwaller de Lut on this on this symbolist Egypt?" And I said, "You bet." And um, and this is the serpent in the sky that we. That we this is the about. serpent in the sky. And so another six years went by of scholarship. I'm a very inefficient and undisciplined writer, but very tenacious. And it took six years to write that book, and uh, and so that put it out. That put it into into English. And and the, and the serpent is. Have you read it? I no, I've never read it. I only came oh, across uh, touches of it. Ah well, it, I mean, it really is. I think Schwaller would be pleased. I worked very closely with his stepdaughter, who was still alive at, at that time. To make sure I didn't make mistakes, um, but it, it really is an in-depth introduction. And Schwaller, like many really brilliant minds, was not a great communicator. So it's very tough to read unadulterated Schwaller. So Serpent serves as a exactly what it's supposed to be an, an in-depth introduction to his work. And in doing the work, the years and years of work on Serpent, I came across this one line in one of his ancillary books um, called uh, the, 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 the King of the Pharaonic Theocracy, which has now been translated, all of his works have now been translated and translated very, very well indeed. And his publishers have done him a great service. And um, in this book, he's talking about the, uh, Schwaller is talking about or writing a long chapter on the, on the history of Egypt. And the Egyptians believed that their history went went much back, much 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 further back into history than the Quackademics will allow, and Gurdjieff talks about that too. But Gurdjieff is not a, is not only is he not a scholar, he wouldn't dream of being a scholar. It's on a take it or leave it basis. An extraordinary guy, Gurdjieff. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, um, Schwaller seemed to be doing in scholarship. It's as though I used to think this, but it was not true, that they were in Paris at the same time in the 20s, and and it was hard to imagine, I, or anyway, to me, that Schwaller had not been, was not a pupil of Gurdjieff's, and Gurdjieff said, you go to Egypt and prove all of this. That wasn't the case at all. I mean, in fact, there was no connection between them, but it was, they were talking the same language, 
Gurdjieff in his own inimitable manner, Schraler strictly philosophy and scholarship, and a very rigorous scholarship at that. Uh, but but um, the I lost my thread for a second. Um, it would seem like the temples are embodying the school of knowledge that they that they housed back in the day, and when people go there. They seem to, whether it be Gurdjieff, whether it be uh, anyone, they start to decode this knowledge in their own way. That that's exactly what happens. The the the, the temples the temples are are themselves. They're a code. They're they're a they're a code into the the workings of divinity, and the gods, the so-called gods. And again, you have to. I mean, there's no field, no scholarly field in the world. Where the same data, which in the case of Egypt are the, are the, is the art and the temples and the pyramids, and the text, of course, give rise to two diametrically opposed explanations. According to the Quackademics, Egypt is this place of marvelously gifted um, artists and architects and so on, but but based all all believing in a kind of tremendously elaborate, goofy superstition. Mm -hmm. In Schraler's case, in symbolist Egypt, it's 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 the expression of of a profound and precise sacred science that expresses itself in myth and symbol, as opposed to mathematics, which our science does. But now it's quite clear that there's a connection that the that the, today's cosmo cosmologists and quantum physicists and and you know high energy whatever. Are in fact talking ancient, ancient Egyptian, but they're expressing themselves in mathematics. And the unfortunate part of that is that you really have to know your math, which I don't, to be able to understand what a physicist is saying. Whereas with Egypt, speaking the symbolic language, it communicates on every level to everyone in the same way. It's what Gurdjieff actually calls ob ob objective. It's objective art. Everybody gets it but each at his or her own level. It's a code. And an ignorant it's person code. might just think that it's art, but their science had reached such a level where art had merged with science, where they were actually tabled to teach you scientific principles of mathematics, frequencies, and angles through their art. And if That's you right. came into these temples, first you would decode a little bit, de depending on where you were in your, in your conscious development, and as you would grow, the temple would reveal more and more of its secrets to you. Well, probably in those days, it's not that you would decode it, but you would experience it. Mm. But you go into, that's what happens with an Egyptian temple or Egyptian art, or any art, actually. You experience art, and you only decode it. I mean, for example, you listen to a, you know, a Bach or a Beethoven mm. or something. If you're not a musician, you can't decode it. Only if you're a, only if you're a, only if you're a musician can you decode it. But in a sense, you don't have to decode it because you feel it. Then if you want to know more, then you have to learn more. If it's music, you have to learn to play the instrument, which I can't play. But that's the only way you really know about music in depth. Otherwise, I mean, you can, you can listen very carefully and get a hell of a lot out of it. Well, so is an Egyptian temple. And you see, Goethe somewhere says... Um, that arch describes, calls architecture frozen music. And this is not just metaphorically or poetically true, it's literally true. Just as music communicates through vibration and frequency and volume and space, as it were, um, but through basically through sound waves, so architecture, architecture communicates also in geometry and measure and number in harmony and proportion because of the way that things are put together is harmonic. It obeys the same laws. This is Schroller was really into this. It obeys the same laws as as music does. So when you're in an Egyptian temple, it's as though you're in the inside of the instrument and you're, and you're getting these literally vibrations, the vibes. And the vibes that you're getting because each of the so-called gods, again, in Quackademia, the gods are just these primitive figments, expressions of 
the primitive imagination that couldn't really understand the mysterious world that we live in. They didn't understand that it was all just an accident and it didn't mean anything. They actually thought it meant something for them. So, so when you're in the, the so-called gods of Egypt are actually cosmic principles. These are the netters. The netters, yeah, or the netter, yeah, the netteru. Um, and we don't, we tend, again, our so-called education, um, which I'm, one of my favorite lines is in one of my books, I think, I forget which one, maybe the astrology book, talking about education, I describe it as that education is to the mind what AIDS is to the immune system. The more exposure you have to it, the more likely it is to be fatal. Um, but anyway, some of us survive it. And, and the gods are actually cosmic principles. We tend not to think of cosmic principles. We don't, I mean, our science doesn't acknowledge cosmic principles, but we experience them. And for example, it's easy. The organic principles are, let's say, fertilization, gestation, birth, growth, maturity, old age, death, renewal. Those are cosmic principles. And Archetypes, if you will. They are different, from, a little bit different from archetypes. Yeah, you could say platonic ideas, mm -hmm. talking about archetypes in terms of, uh, you say that a platonic idea is, is an archetype. Okay, yes, you could. So, they would put a face to, this, to, these, to these mechanisms, to these ideas, to stir they, up the emotions in you. Exactly. They, they, would, they would pick the animal or the plant or the insect or the structure that that best, let's say, capture the essence of the archetype, and that would be its that would be its symbol. And so these these were the gods. In other words, they were these they were they were archetypes or cosmic principles, and and they were expressed in the baboon and the ibis for wisdom, the the hippopotamus for gestation. Why a hippopotamus for gestation? Well, you know, for, for pregnancy. Look, I mean, what could be more pregnant than the pregnant hippopotamus? <laughs> and the other esoteric level, it's, it's, I mean, this is a neat thing about symbols. But, I mean, symbols are meaningful only to those who know the symbolism. So if you're brought up in the ghetto in Queens or something like that, you've never even seen an animal. And it's very hard to relate to what a heron is or what a hippopotamus is or what anything is. I mean, you've never seen anything other than a fly now and again. But if you live in nature, in contact with nature, these things resonate. So you know the difference between a dog and a cat, and a cat and a lion, and a lion and a heron. All of these things instantly convey their, their soul to whoever's perceiving them in their own way. So all of the gods, or each of the gods, are connected with an animal or bird or insect or several of them. And each of the gods, who remember are cosmic principles, are, are expressed or have their own numbers associated with them. This is too complicated to talk about in an hour. But the, the specific numbers that are associated with each god or goddess um, give rise or the interplay between the principles or the actions, let's say, the the meaning of the significance of those particular principles find expression in particular geometries, harmonies, measures, and so on. And those are written into or expressed subliminally. I mean, they're there. If you measure them, you'll find the harmonies are there. But when you're there, it's not as though you're hearing a symphony and it's having this particular effect on you. You're not hearing it. But you're you're getting it through all of your sensitive faculties. Now that's not to say that everyone in the culture got it. It's much like our culture, where there's a story portrayed to the masses, and it's only the ones who know that can truly decode the numbers, the symbolism, and oh, the myth story. Yeah, but everybody feels them. You yes. see, that's that's the advantage of of, of a symbolist of a symbol of, of symbolism is that everyone gets it. As an example, and I always use this on my trips. And actually, this is the thing with Egypt, is that it's like I always say, that, that I start often lectures off by saying Egypt is like sex, and that gets everybody's attention. And then why is it like sex? 
because you can read all about it, and that's kind of interesting, and you can look at pictures, and that's a bit more graphic, but until you experience it, you don't know anything, you don't actually understand it at all. So this is what Egypt, the trip to Egypt, as you know, I lead trips. Mm -hmm. um, it actually puts people experientially in touch with with the, with with the netters, with the with the netaru, with the cosmic principles, so that when you're in a Hathor temple, you're imbibing, as it were, Hathor music. And when you're in a Sekhmet temple, you're getting a Sekhmet music. And when you're in a Horus temple, you're getting a Horus music. And we, of course, I mean, it's it's no longer our tradition or anything like that. But you can bet that an initiated priest in Egypt's time would would be working in these temples and doing ceremonies in the temples and imbibing it and would be effectively connected with that particular divine principle. So, I mean, this is... is now, so, there were priests for every single temple, right? There was the priests of oh, Ra. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Did they sometimes and, become both at the same time or would they usually just stick to one vibration? I don't know. I don't know. I, I suspect in those days... Um, you know, you, you couldn't really zip around by automobile. You had to go up the Nile. There weren't even any roads in Egypt. <clears throat> Didn't need roads because the Nile flooded every year and it would have wiped all the roads out. <clears throat> I suspect that I mean, there's traffic up and down the Nile, but my guess is that that people didn't travel very much. And if you were connected with the temple, if you were a, a, a priest at a high level, you let's say you would start... Basically, you'd, you'd... Yeah, run us through the initiation process. Well, insofar as we know it, I mean, really, an, an, an analogously, let's say, playing Major League Baseball mm -hmm. or concert class violin is an initiatic process. And you don't switch, generally speaking, from the violin and then suddenly pick up the accordion and then, you know, go off and play a kazoo. You... You 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 are initiated into the into the mastery of that particular instrument or trade. I mean, not many. There are a few crossovers, but most baseball players do not play football, and most football players do not play golf or anyway, not at a professional level. So, in fact, you don't have to, and you don't want to necessarily. Yeah, there are rare individuals who really master several disciplines. But not really. I mean, mostly they don't. I mean, I know from my own discipline is that is that I'm a writer, and that's what I am. I'm not a musician, and I'm not a painter, and I'm not a football player. You know, I, I do my... I mean, it doesn't mean that I don't have fun doing other stuff, but no, I mean, it's hard enough writing well. Well, I've heard of stories of people waiting 20 years to get into uh, to one of these mystery schools, be it Plato or Aristotle, and there must have been something that struck them as an unbelievable awe to come into Egypt and want to uh, want to give 20 years of their life just to get in. Oh, I don't know about that. But anyway, all of that's hearsay. I don't know how long it took them to get in. Pythagoras supposedly, but remember, Pythagoras, the, the one biography of, that, of him that exists is written by, what the hell is his name? Not Eusebius, Eudoxus, name escapes me at the moment. But anyway, it's 600 years after Pythagoras' death. So he, he supposedly studied for Egypt in 22 years. See, 22 is in the, one mm -hmm. of those old numbers. 22 is a number that's associated with, a, with completion or a complete cycle for reasons, again, too complicated to go into here. So with all of these ancient texts, whenever they're talking about numbers, you've got to take it with a grain of salt because they're usually or often not meant to be uh, they're not meant to be um, taken literally, necessarily. It but seems in, that they're speaking to us in multiple dimensions, where you could take often. it. Often, yes. It, this is a yes. this is a higher yeah. mind. What I'd love to ask oh, you yeah. is definitely what they were preparing people for was what they called the afterlife. Now, was did that did that mean that they were going to actually uh, kill the person, or were they preparing no. them for an out of body type experience? Well, no, neither. Actually, the the afterlife is. Again, this is a, you know our trans our translation of the duat. We don't really have a word for that. I mean, the closest is the is the Tibetan bardo, 
it's the, it's the state it's a state or a condition of actually it's purgatory in, in Christianity it's where the soul does its final work to either get somewhere or not get somewhere so so what they're it's not that they're preparing it's that all of life this way Egypt is a one issue civilization I mean everything that's that's what's so amazing about it that all of its creative energy is directed toward the quest for immortality which is not wink wink nod nod a bunch of old superstition it's the it's it's the premise let's say it's the philosophical not premise but I would say knowledge and in other words the 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 academics whenever they talk about Egypt it's always the Egyptians believe this or the Egyptians believe that ah and it never occurs to them not ever that maybe they knew and they don't know the Egyptians knew but they don't know if they didn't know they wouldn't have built this spectacular architecture and art and so on for 3000 years i mean our civilization which is not a civilization anyway shiny barbarism is coming unstuck in front of our noses after just a couple of hundred years mm-hmm. and egypt kept going for 3000 years so it's a totally different it's a totally different kettle of civilization and it's only when you go there it's it's not a preparation for the afterlife it's a prep all of life is a preparation for a higher level it's not the afterlife in other words death is is a transition it's not an end or anyway that's what it's supposed to be is a transition and ultimately and again this is the, the wonderful language or the the imagery of um of egypt is that in i mean in death and the, the king it's all so you know the king is supposed to be this absolute dictator of tyrant pharaoh type character and all the people of these slaves it's not that at all the king is the prototype in other words he he represents and probably in my in my view probably actualized the doctrine in himself and if he didn't it wouldn't have lasted for 3000 years i mean the king is both the emperor and the pope is supposed to be the representative of god on earth i mean god help him <laughs> if they are <laughs> you'll have to see what these guys are and what they do so even even there i mean Christianity is actually remedial Egypt. It's it's Egypt without the science. It comes right out of Egypt, um, but even so, it lasted. It's so far. It's got, it's lasted about three thousand. It's lasted two thousand years, which is pretty amazing in its own right. But you know, if the priests keep jumping on the choir boys, it's not going to last much longer. However, I mean, Egypt lasted for the full three thousand years, and when you when you are there and experiencing it it's it's not difficult to see they're not preparing anybody for the afterlife they are providing the means for for becoming in the in the wonderful language of one of the myths that the the, the in death the pharaoh but the pharaoh remember is the prototype human being in death the realized human being um, the, the, the exact language is ka unites with ba the ka is the sort of all of our different the elements of our personality which we have to which we have to put all together so that we're not fragmented normally we're fragmented unites with ba ba is let's say represents a divine spark that all of us even including dick cheney is is born with um and so ka unites with ba and then the language goes on and becomes a star and sails across the sky in the company of ra which is usually translated as the sun which is really the 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 solar principle the initiating principle sails in the, in, across the sky in the company of ra in the boat of millions of years so this is a very lovely expression poetic expression of eternal life and but it may even be not just symbolism it may even be true you don't know and it's funny how these things percolate down through history did you see the lion king yes the movie the lion king did you recognize the story well the story oh i remember the story so throw something at me what's the story the story is that there's a 
There's a father figure who gives rise to the new king. As the new king is about to rise, his father or his prototype is shot down and killed and he's left to go on a shamanic quest to find himself and revenge his father. Well, that's true, but what does that remind you of? Think of a play. Think of a play in which in which the, the king Macbeth? is killed, in fact, by his brother. What? Macbeth? No, Hamlet. Oh, Hamlet. Yeah, Hamlet. But what that story is, it's much older than that. It's, it's the Isis Osiris Horus myth, which, in fact, I don't know if you know the book called Hamlet's Mill, one of the... By so a, you're saying... Uh, what is this? Is Scar is Set? Is what? Is Set who kills... Set. Set. Set is... Set is... Well, in Hamlet, Set is whoever the whoever who's the who who kills the king in Set. Who is murders it like his king. evil his evil cousin or evil? Well, son? he's the brother, but he's yeah. the brother. See, so Set Set is the Osiris is the good king. Mm -hmm. Osiris is I forget the name of the king in Hamlet. And Hamlet is the is the lion cub in in the in in the Disney movie. Somebody Disney is a very peculiar, interesting bunch of people there because somebody knows something. They're terrible people. I mean, the greediest goddamn scumbags in the world. And they put out sometimes these magical things. Now, if you remember The Lion King, there's a scene in which the little lion cub is looking up at the sky and he says to his father, he's pointing to the stars and he says, what are those? And the father says, oh, those are the souls of dead kings. That tells you that whoever wrote the script didn't just know their Hamlet, they knew their Egypt. Because only that's not in Hamlet, the souls of dead kings. Now the Egyptians, we don't know why stars form. I mean, there's a bunch of gas floating around out there. You know, they, the cosmologists, they don't know why, why, why stars are there or why the whole thing is expanding. They don't know anything about causation. So maybe it should be taken literally. I don't know either, I'm just, I'm just saying. But anyway, so Egypt, Egypt is is devoted entirely. I mean, yeah, they had their wars and fights and blah, 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 but their civilization is based entirely upon this quest for eternal life, which is not a passage through the afterlife. I mean, what does that mean? It's a, let's say it's a passage of, it's a, a passage of transformation. And at least in Egypt, and it may be that even earlier, it's, it's, there's a, a fair amount of scholarship that says that the whole idea of, 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 um, of the afterlife, of, of let's say, of, of carrying on the quest for immortality through the afterlife is a degeneration. You're supposed to do this in, within, the, within the space of your lifetime, mm -hmm. which actually percolates, it becomes Christianity. And it becomes alchemy, it becomes everything. It's almost like well, the Egyptian it, school was hidden and then carried on throughout history. Never well, forgotten. what happened was that it all broke apart around Cleopatra's time. And and then somehow, this is a, an era that I'm not that familiar with, but it must be a fascinating study because there's probably a fair amount of, um, of documentation that you can follow. But alchemy and astrology and Kabbalah even, and certainly number symbolism and Neoplatonism, all of these different streams that flourished in Alexandria in the early in the early centuries of the Christian era, Christianity itself, derive from Egypt. But then they all go sort of their separate ways. If you read, you know, if you if you do some reading into the Renaissance, I don't know if you're familiar with wonderful Renaissance scholar Francis Yates from Oxford, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment and the Art of Memory and a whole bunch of books. She didn't quite get Egypt, but she's very good, Giordano Bruno and all of these characters, the, 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 the magicians, oh, and magic, ceremonial magic, all of that derives from Egypt, but all went sort of in separate ways, mostly losing the coherence that, that Egypt once had. See, this is this is the thing, and again, you, you get it when you go to Egypt, and otherwise it's difficult, but it's a civilization in which, in which art, in which art, science, philosophy, and religion were fused into one inextricable whole, exactly the opposite of what we have now, where there's no connection whatsoever between any of these things. And did the, the Egyptians say that this came from a golden age that was passed down to them? And, yeah, and 
they say that it goes even further back. And in fact, that I digressed from my original subject there, talking about Schwaller and the Egyptians thinking that their civilization was older, or believing, or knowing that their civilization was much older than they given credit for. And Schwaller has this long chapter in the book called Now, in English, Sacred Science, The King of the Pharaonic Theocracy. And he puts together, it's a long scholarly um, argument or, or discussion about the writers of Greco-Roman antiquity, all of whom are quoting the Egyptian priests in one way or another, fragmentary, you know, the net, almost nothing's complete from that time. Because the whole thing is breaking apart. And they're, but they're all claiming that Egypt was much, much older. And there are a couple of tablets, one um, stone stela called the Palermo stone, and another fragmentary papyrus called the Turin papyrus. Well, oh, I can't do this. Ah, just have to leave it go. Okay. Um, Hello, this is John. Oh, shit. <laughs> I will call you back. Thank you. Oh, well. Okay. You can, you can edit that out. <laughs> um, and the, so Schwaller has this long chapter where he's citing all of these sources from uh, Roman times, first section, so those centuries, let's say second century BC to second century AD, where Egypt is still enough left of it so that the Greek and the Roman scholars are there or visitors and they're questioning the priests and there's an interchange between them. And then, so Schwaller has this long chapter citing all of these sources. And then at the very end, of this long, long chapter, he says, oh yes, and of course, the Great Sphinx of Giza shows unmistakable signs of aquatic, of aquatic erosion, in exact translation from the French. And when I read that, that was the penny dropped in the slot, and I said, okay, the rest of this argument is very interesting and very plausible and pretty convincing, but it's not science, and there's no way they can turn it into science. Water weathering is science, that's geology, and you should be able to prove that one way or the other. Either it is or it isn't. So anyway, that started off the other long quest that's now been going on. Let's see, when did I read um, uh, the, the Sacred Science? Late 60s, maybe? Something like that. And so when I wrote The Serpent, the whole long last chapter is about establishing, I had to do a lot of, now then I had to do geological research, no, I'm not a geologist, but actually I did a pretty good job. I, mean, I only made a couple of uh, two serious mistakes that really weren't my fault. The, 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 uh, the material wasn't there to find, because had, had it been available, I probably would have said, oh yeah, that's right. But anyway, I didn't understand that it was rainwater falling on the Sphinx or over the course of the plateau that was responsible for it. It, it, it. I thought it was floods, huge Nile floods, though even that, I didn't half believe my own research, but there were, I mean, I had solid backup that it was water weathering. Anyway, so that, that led, once I read that, that the, the Great Sphinx had been weathered by water, um, I mean, because the assumption always has been that it's wind and sand. Now that's changed even without quite acknowledging that I'm right. And and because uh, um, now they, 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 they agree that it's water, but they some stupid cockamamie argument they put forward to try to preserve the chronology. But I realized that if that were true, because I knew a little bit about Egyptian geology, that and that the Sahara is a relatively new desert, that if it was weathered by water, this couldn't have happened because Egypt has been bone, not entirely bone dry since about 10,000 BC, a couple of periods where there was some rainfall there, but nothing to produce anyway, in my opinion, to produce the extreme weathering that you see on the Sphinx. So uh, when I read that one line, I said, aha, if you can prove that, you can turn all of history upside down. And Charlie himself didn't realize what a bombshell he'd come up with and he died about the year, I think the year or two, two years after he wrote the book. So it was quite clear 
that he didn't realize himself that that was the scientific key to overthrowing the entire scenario that you get in any school about about human civilization because I mean the Sphinx itself is un, I, to my mind unquestionably the most spectacular sculpture on earth and even more important the temples around it are are not spectacular as Egyptian temples go they're these these stark smallish I mean not huge temples but built of blocks of stone I mean half the size of this room these are gigantic 50 75 100 ton, 100 ton blocks that are jointed slotted into place like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle I mean we can't we couldn't build those temples today with the machinery that we have and so if the Sphinx is weathered by water and the Sahara is a relatively new desert say 10,000 BC or so it would mean that the Sphinx, the most spectacular sculpture on earth, and its its attendant temples, which we couldn't build today, come from a time where there's not supposed to be any civilization at all. So this was my revelation. I mean, Schwaller did all of the work, but 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 he he didn't. As I said, I'm, I never met him, so I don't, I don't know if he realized how important that observation was. But that's occupied a lot of my time over the last, when was this I'm talking about, 67, 68, I'm reading this stuff, you know, it's 40, more than 40 years ago, and a lot of the time has gone into establishing or to, to demonstrating that. As I said, it was a long chapter at the end of The Serpent, which is first published in 79, 78 or 79, it took another 10 years to find my colleague, my good friend and colleague Robert Schock, the geologist who could actually use, you know, he had the credentials to be able to, A, verify the theory in the first place, and B, stick his tenured neck out to say that, yeah, this is, this is the case. So, I mean, we're in, we're in the middle of this big, really very interesting event. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear it. You find, you find out that the Sphinx could be dated back about 10,000 BC, well, well, and at well, that point, it would see the rising Leo constellation uh, I, rising in front of him on the sunrise. What does Zahi Hawa say when you say these two facts to him? Oh, I don't say those facts to him. <laughs> he's, not, he's not interested in that. But A, Zahi is no longer in power there. Mm -hmm. I just heard you. And B, after a, a long... All of this is complicated, and we don't have time for it now. But um, I, I made my peace with Zahi. We were bitter enemies for a long time. I can time. imagine. And then, then through a strange, more strange set of circumstances, became more than civil to each other. I mean, Zahi is a supreme egotist, and, and you know, so when I'm with him, I don't really contradict him much. But, but I've always had this feeling. I mean, I'm sorry that he's no longer in power because I don't know who the new guy is, and I don't know how I'll get along. I know I understand he's kind of an academic sort of character, and Zahi was the you know, was a, was, a pro, was a showman, but I always had the sense that if I could get him in the right mood and I could present the evidence in just the right way, he's less doctrinaire than he seems to be, and he'd suddenly get it, he'd suddenly see it. I mean, he's not really a philosopher or an intellectual or a scholar even, he's a field archaeologist, that's what he really likes to do, and he's a good one, but he doesn't really you know, put the two and two and stuff together, the, it's the academics who, who actually have the intellectual equipment and training who should be interested in this stuff, but who are not interested at all. I mean, because it, it contravenes everything they spent all of these years, you know, being slaves and whoring to get their stupid PhDs. And now suddenly comes, someone comes along from out of left field and says, you guys are completely wrong. <laughs> Everything you've thought, at least about the chronology of civilization and the way it developed, is, is completely wrong. So they don't like this, needless to say. And um, so that's the situation that we're in now. But anyway, that was, that's the other part of this whole Schwaller story, because having written Serpent in the Sky, I don't really have much to... I don't actually have the specialization to add to this, but lots of people have come along, not lots, but 
you know, a few, a number of really good scholars have come along and, and, and kind of carried the work further in different directions in terms of the symbolism, in terms of the, of the geometry, particularly in terms of the mathematics and geometry, in terms of the astronomy, uh, the astrology we don't know about other than that they must have had it, but it wasn't sort of our kind of astrology, which is, you know, what's a good day to buy a poodle? That's not, that's not their interest. It's what's a, a propitious time or, you know, what do we do at such and such a time under this stellar or planetary configuration to do thus and such? And actually, because your questions were on ceremonial magic and that sort of thing, I mean, all of Egypt, the rituals of Egypt are basically, you know that nowadays we, we, we have in, in our shiny bar, barbarism that we call advanced civilization, pale reminiscences of what there, what there was before. So one of the big things going on, you know, anyway, over the last 40 or 50 years are these stupid reenactments of the Civil War or, you know, I don't know what, slavery or whatever the hell civil reenactments they do. But actually, the Egyptians, Egyptian religion was this gigantic, magical, it was a magical reenactment of cosmology. In other words, there were, there were these huge processions that would go from one temple, I'm talking about mainly in Luxor now, the others we don't know that much about, and they'd go from one temple to another, to another, to another. Each of the temples represented a particular stage of Genesis. For example, uh, Karnak represents the creation of the material world. Luxor represents the role of humanity within that, within that, um, within that creation. Across the river is, um, is um, Mednet Habu, which represents, in, in one sense, the beginning and also harvest time and the end. And then that's connected, and this one's a bit fuzzy in my mind, I'm not exactly sure why, to the great Hatshepsut temple, which is in turn connected back to Karnak. So there are processions that go from one to the other to the other with all of these people singing and dancing, their pictures of the processions, um, and doing these, in other words, performing, even if the people who are in the middle of the procession didn't know what they were doing, they were resonating, let's say, they were resonating to these were these terrific acts of the equinox or the solstice or uh... well the equinoxes and solstices played most of the temples are are oriented in one way or another to equinoxes and solstices and sometimes the processions would take place on those times other times they'd take place with Sirius rising or with the, mm -hmm. the flood of the Nile different times but never haphazard but what's going on as I said, it's like a, it's like a, a sacred reenactment, just as, for example, the symbolism, we were talking about it before, and I meant to, I meant to say this, the, the symbolism, because we don't have any valid symbolism anymore, I mean, a flag, an American flag, or an Ethiopian flag, is just, it's an allegory, maybe, but it, it's not a symbol, it has no depth to it. Um, but, but we have a valid, we still have a valid symbolism, but it's secular, not sacred, and that's, let's say, a political cartoon. Political cartoon, let's say, has Uncle Sam for America, and John Bull for England, and La Liberté for France, and the Russian bear all cut up into pieces like Osiris for Russia. And, and the cartoonist, the, the political cartoonist, is portraying a very elaborate scenario that you have to be indoctrinated into the symbolism to realize what's going on. But if you have, and, and it's, it's vertical, because if you're a truck driver and you hardly follow, you know, I mean, you barely know anything about what's going on in the news, you get it, you still get it at a certain level. You recognize Uncle Sam and, you know, all of these symbols. If you're a, you know, if you're a Harvard PhD political scientist who's really involved in the news, you'll get it at a much more advanced and sophisticated level, but everyone will get it. So that's symbolism at work. So with sacred symbolism, then you're getting, you know, Isis and Osiris and Horus. So on the one level, on the popular unschooled level, it's still there. But at the higher levels, 
it has these 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 it's vertical it has this depth of meaning that resonates and so when we go into an egyptian temple we're we're moved i mean you almost can't help but be moved by the by by the, by the stone music what we're not moved by is the symbolism because it's not ours anymore we can recognize that it's you know fabulous artwork but that and unless you're brought up with it you probably don't get it it's sort of like an american trying to learn about cricket you know i mean you're brought up with baseball and football and basketball and yeah you can watch cricket or even soccer I mean, nowadays everyone plays soccer but when i grew up I mean, to me, a soccer game is a bunch of guys running fast on the field. You know, that doesn't, I don't know what they're doing. But, you know, I watch baseball, it's sort of fun. Um, then I, you know, then I understand the fine points because I'm brought up with it, even though I'm not a baseball player. So anyway, but that's symbolism. That's how symbolism works. It works on this visceral level as long as you are, to a certain extent, initiated in the meaning of the symbols, which you would be if you were in Egypt, no matter what. I mean, even our symbolism, you know, if you're brought up in the in the jungles of New Guinea, you're not going to understand a political cartoon in the New York Times or something like that, because it's not their language anymore. But it seems like all these symbols do show up time and time again throughout history, and they do bear a resemblance in the fact that they may be about human illumination. And when you achieve this state you start to decode and understand these symbols and then you want to portray them out to the outside world. Um, no, you know, I, I'm, you know, I think, I, I, I think if you're brought up, I think you understand them innately. You don't have to come to understand them. I you only know, meant at an immense, at a, at a great profound level because subconsciously you will always understand them and you will always resonate with them. Yeah, well, but I mean, the shamans probably couldn't articulate to you in language because they, 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 they don't have, they never had the need to, or maybe it's not even, maybe it's not even an advancement um, to be able to articulate. I mean, we one of our big problems is that we're rational. I mean, we intellectualize everything, whereas whereas the, the shamans and, and, and traditional people it's all experience, and nothing gets in the way of them of them experiencing their lives. So all of these symbols, they don't have to think about why a baboon and an ibis are used for wisdom, or why a hippopotamus is used for pregnancy, or why a falcon is used for the return to the source. They it's it's, it's part of their it's part of their nature, but as they as they develop, it's again like playing the violin or playing a game. Well, the initiates gain a source of mastery. Well, that's exactly what they do. I mean, as as we, do, the funny thing is, is that the this ancient doctrine looks so alien to us, and yet we have the analogies in front of our nose. I mean, only a couple of people, I mean, a handful of people, can play. The violin at a concert level, and only a handful of people can play baseball at a concert, you know, at a at a at a at a stadium level. But it's quite clear what's involved in doing that, which is complete dedication, mm -hmm. well, a talent to begin with, and then a complete dedication, and then all the rest of the stuff has to fall into place to become a master. So so it was in those days, except that what they ended up with was not Yankee Stadium, you know, or, or Carnegie Hall even, but the Temple of Luxor, the yeah. pyramids, of, you know, and so on. So, now, in these, in these temples, there are, uh, there are sometimes these reliefs of offerings handed to either the gods or from the gods to the pharaohs. And I'd love to ask you a couple questions about when there's the offering of the pyramid, and I forget what they, they call it, Ma'at? But it's it's an offering of white of of a white pyramid that is given well, to people. No, Mat is a is, is an ostrich is usually the figure of Mat who represents cosmic law, cosmic equilibrium, and her symbol is an ostrich feather. Um, I'm not sure when you're talking about what they're offering a pyramid of something. I'll, I'll have to get you the uh, the actual. Uh, tell story. me because because well the offering is always again whatever the offering is. It's a principle, mm -hmm. and and if it's the king offering it, 
to the God. In other words, he's he's telling the principal actually that he's he's his obedient he's his obedient servant, as it were, and then vice versa. Sometimes you have the gods. They always say the the the, the academics always say that you'll see, for example, Horus and Set with their hands on the on the this is a famous one on on the head of the king, and they always say he's protecting the king. The king doesn't need any protection. What they're doing is that they are empowering the king, who, in fact, in the case of Horus and Set, is reconciling these two opposing principles. So. Basically, and then there are, there's this, I mean, in Egypt, there's a ton of work still to be done, but not by me. But there's a science of gesture. There's a science of headdresses. Nothing is an accident. The colors are not an accident. Yeah. Why do they of, keep putting their left foot forward? Well, that's, that's a fairly easy one. It's kind of automatic. I mean, if you're ever in the army, which you weren't, lucky you, but I was, um, you start off by going left, right, left, right. It probably has something to do, left brain, right brain, yes. the connections, but you start off naturally with your left foot. Now, whether or not women do, I don't know, because sometimes, you know, the things are reversed. It would be an interesting study. Somebody could do a PhD on who start, starts off with their left foot and who starts off with their, with their right. I'm not sure. Why I asked you about the symbolism and the reliefs is because... There seems to be a lot of offerings that seem to resemble ethnogenic drugs, and I want to know if they were. Buried. Maybe, yeah, they certainly had them. <laughs> you can be sure they had them. You know they had hemp. Mm -hmm. The blue lotus, which is takes plays a major part in their symbolism, is a mild hallucinogenic. Um, they found, not fairly recently, evidences of cocaine on mummies, but they're late mummies. So th this tells you that there's trade between Egypt and the and the New World, because they're not going to get cocaine from anywhere else. No drug dealers in those days. So you're going to have to go all the way to Bolivia or somewhere to get it. Um, what else do they have? Probably opium. Not sure. There might be enough evidence if you went deep into the reliefs to see what the plants were, because they're all they're all taken from life. They're not. Mm -hmm. Invented plants. Well, I just I just love the symbol of the duat, which is the five the five star. And sometimes you would see him coming from a relief of the sun. Ra is sending his his waves of light onto one of the nations. Sometimes it's Akhenaten who is receiving the waves, and they seem to be coming in the form of a datura flower. And when you look at a datura flower okay. head on, you see the duat symbol. Of a what flower? Detura. What kind of flower? Datura, moonflower or jimson weed? Oh, I don't know. That I don't know. The it's it's been it's thought the, the, the headdress of, of the goddess called Sashat, who is the who's the, the the female counterpart of Jehuti, who represents wisdom, uh, cosmic wisdom, is a, usually a seven petaled, sometimes more, sometimes oh, less. Yeah. <laughs> which looks rather rather like a marijuana leaf. And oh yeah, it, it looks uncanny. Well and it's green. Could be that they had these. I mean, it's next to impossible that they didn't have them, because they certainly had the hemp. You can't have hemp and not know that it that it has a you know that it has a that it has a, a, a psychotropic event uh, that it has a psychotropic um, uh, effect on capacity the power. Yeah. Whether or not they had. Um, Mushrooms, I don't know. You, you don't. You never see. I've, I've never noticed mushrooms in the iconography. But they all, almost certainly they would have had those things. I would have like, loved to. Sh I'd love to show you the Akhenaten where he holds up the uh, what looks like Amanita muscaria to the sun. I'm not sure. You'd have to show me the. I'd have to see the. Uh, send me a picture. Because <laughs> what the what the uh, Christians come out of that uh, that world with seems to be. Uh, a history of use of Amanita muscaria, and I don't know if you if you're familiar with the work of John A. Allegro. He goes into that. In yeah, depth. I, am. I am actually. Well, Amanita, they could, they could, they could well have had that, but you don't see it. You know, I mean, I I'm, I know about enough about this stuff. Yeah, I don't see anything that looks like mushrooms in Egypt. Okay. And Amanita is really, I mean, immediately recognizable. That's why I'd love to show you the relief because maybe they just didn't talk about it because. 
Uh, no, nah, 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 they, nah, they wouldn't do a thing like that. If they, you know, in Egypt, what you see is what you got. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and and, and, the, and the, the thing is to, I mean, certain things they don't show you. This is true. But it's hard to imagine, because you have all of these bouquets and flowers and offerings and all of these things, hard to imagine they can seal something like that. On the other hand, you never see, for example, astronomers at work. You never see architects at work. You see people doing all of these other things, building boats and plowing the fields and, you know, making statues. You never see architects at work. You never see astronomers at work. You and see when the Romans came, they sometimes chose death rather than to reveal their astronomy skills and their skills of how they built those buildings. They, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, I don't think... Well, you know, they were able to do pretty amazing things even at the end, but but the things that they were doing, the, the further back you go, the more sophisticated the work is. So by the time it gets to Roman times, they can't do a lot of the things that they could do a thousand years earlier. or any. Yeah, they didn't for a variety of reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. the cycles of time... We won't get into this here <laughs> with the Kali, with the yuga cycles and things like that. It was you know, Egypt is at one of the big mysteries and fascinating mystery is that it was at its height at its beginning. And the further back you go, the more advanced it is, which is one of the reasons why the Sphinx is such a bombshell uh, academically, because it, it because it destroys the whole nation, the whole nation. Oh shit! What is that? Hold on. Well. It's my wife. <laughs> I didn't tell her I had a phone call. Um, so about the Sphinx, have you ever heard of the work of Edgar Casey and the Temple? Of course, yeah, not, yeah, sure I have. I'd love to but, hear your take on it. Hello, this well, is John Rett. Well, Please leave a message and I will call you back. Thank you. What do you mean, this is John Rett? Please leave a message. <laughs> Maybe in the bathroom. Anyway, it is I. I think. Love it. Um, <laughs> um, I didn't tell her I had this phone call. No, well, Casey. Casey's a remarkable guy, um, and his his um, his um, his medical uh, diagnoses and prescriptions and stuff are really documented and remarkable. But really, his 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 prophecies about Egypt and so on really just don't check out with his temple beautiful and his temple whatever. It's just, he's all, he's all, he's, you know, it's, it ain't there. And then he says, yeah, the Sphinx and the pyramids are older. This is true. And he puts a date of 10,000 BC. I think they're probably older than that. But he's absolutely right about that. Very interesting. He talks about the temp, the Hall of Records mm -hmm. that's in the, under the Sphinx. And our seismographs, which don't do any channeling whatsoever, say there's something there. And whether or not anyone will ever get around to checking it out, it's hard to say. It's actually, everyone says, why don't they look? Well, it's actually not that easy to look. They could put down um, fiber, op drill a hole and put down the little fiber optic cameras, but the, the, the chamber or cavity or void or whatever it is, five meters underground is full of water now. The water table has risen so that it's full of water. So even if you put one of those things down, you wouldn't be able to see very much. And then you can't dig down there because to do that would be this huge excavation. You'd need coffer dams to pump the water out faster than it was coming in. Mm -hmm. One day, someday or another, if the, if the theory gets recognized so that they can't argue about it anymore, and we're getting not too far from that position, I think. Maybe then they'll decide that because of the great publicity it will bring, that they'll do it. And also, I mean, the whole, the whole discipline of Egyptology has to, get, has to get turned around for that to happen. But Not just Egyptology. My, my belief is that that's not far off now, because the evidence is coming in from a variety of, of directions now, we didn't get a chance to talk about that, and we won't, because I'm running out of words. Um, but it's getting close to the it's getting close to the time where they can't deny the evidence anymore, 
And given the nature of the media nowadays, it's possible to get the word out there to a lot of people and they can't shut us up. So my sense of it is providing the whole world doesn't blow up within the next couple of years, which is... <laughs> might well happen. Um, no, I mean, things are... These things are... We're living uh, in incredible times. These are, these are interesting times, as they say. Um, and I'm glad I'm where I am in the hills here in the Catskills than somewhere else. Where are you actually in the, ta in the city itself of Montreal? We're, we're right it's outside the city. We got 60 acres of land. Is, 60 acres of land as soon as suburbia starts. Uh, sorry, ends. So suburbia ends, and then it's us on 60 acres, and we're trying to make a self sustainable community to show the, the suburbia oh, that the, there's a different oh, way to your, do it. That's your Valhalla. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's oh, that's interesting. But what happens when they take when they when they buy you out? Yeah, they can try. They can try, but but it's not about the money. It's it's just about showing people the alternative methods. That, oh yeah. That they want you to consume and they want you to buy up this idea of materialism when there actually is a better way, and they're just they don't want to show it to you because it's 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 in a sense it's going to be free if you master it. Well, I'm 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 all hundred percent in favor of that. Anyway, um, John, I would, that's enough. What are we oh, on? Oh, yeah, totally. 30. Okay. Uh, so, thanks so um, much, John. That was fun. Uh, for uh, me, it's uh, one of the funnest things I've ever done. Oh, well, good. Um, and good luck with Valhalla. That's a, that's a, a, noble, a noble project. And, there, you know, there are a number of these things going on. The trouble is, unfortunately, that we're in a terrible minority. Yeah, but I How think this is about the yugas, where things are starting to change that's, right well, now. They are. Yeah, things are, we'll put it this way, things are at at a melting point now. I mean, Schroller, Schroller, Schroller is an absolutely brilliant man. He has one, a number of wonderful observations is that everything, everything in the universe is organic. In other words, it all goes through the life cycle of gestation, birth, etc., etc. Now, analogously, when for the seed to sprout, this is what's true in agriculture is true in civilization. For the seed to sprout, the husk must crack. So, and then there's a stage, and this is botany, when an acorn, let's say, for it to sprout, it has to dissolve. It has it's to in die. the earth and everything, it, it has to dissolve. And then there's a critical stage where it's, it's like a mass of jelly. It's not one thing or another, it's chaos. And out of that will, will come the little sprout. And then, then it's a question of, is it going to survive or not? It can be trampled into the ground by any wandering jackass. But my, my read on the situation right now is we're in that, in that stage of jelly, of chaos, in which anything can happen. And it's not preordained one way or the other. It could go, the seed could sprout and get tended and become a new civilization, or the seed could sprout and the, the wandering jackasses come around and eat it or trample it down, and then we're cooked. It's an amazing metaphor. What you're saying is it's up to the gardener. It is up. Well, it is up to the gardener. Yeah, it's up to the gardener. And you're the gardener of your own garden. And as long as you no, empower well, yourself. Well, you are right. Well, it, the number is. It's funny, see, because I, I have a. I don't know if it's on my website still. A, a little essay on civilization, and that is that again metaphor or analogy. That civilization is like a park in which the, the big trees are the are the great religions now all stunted and warped and dying of rot and all the rest of it. And what's happened is that the whole garden, the whole park has been has been taken over by poison ivy and brambles and all the rest of it. The, the, the seeds for the seeds to sprout, somebody has to come along with a with a flamethrower or a chainsaw and take down all the brambles and get all the garbage out of there so that the, so that the, the sprouts, so that the little seeds can sprout. I'm behind the chainsaw and the flamethrower. 